Good morning, all dividend investors. So tell me, what chart do you like more? This one from the S&P 500, which is currently 20% down since the start of this year, or my annual dividend income growth chart and my year over year. So what you could see, the S&P 500 or the SPY index is 20% down, but look at my dividend income. Everything in red here, it had this been growing since last year. I mean, this is amazing, right? This is truly amazing. And for me, this is the power of dividend investing. Because if we look back at the S&P 500, let's say a year from now, it is still down 12%. All my dividends are up. Actually, quarter to date or year to date, if you look at it, I'm already almost at my full dividend income compared to last year. Just the first two quarters alone, if you would compare them, I'm 80% up. I do realize that 15% or something like that comes from a stronger US dollar, which is kind of favorable towards me um, having my portfolio in a euro dominated currency. So, hey, I take these charts every time. I don't look so much at share prices. I really, really much more prefer my dividend income going up. And these are the charts that I'm living with. And this is also important, right? Because as investors, we really need to understand what we are investing for. My plan is at a certain moment to retire from dividends. So the only single thing that I actually really need to measure is, is my dividend income going up over time? I don't care so much about total return, share price appreciation, capital appreciation. It doesn't really tell me anything. Of course, maybe this is not entirely true because you know, not every dividend is the same. Some dividends are safe, some are not. But generally speaking, dividend income is what I track. But if this triggers you in thinking like, shit, I don't have my plan yet. Well, don't worry, I got you covered. You can go to my website. If you go here to the resources tab, you see here something called early retirement calculator. If you open it up, you see something like this, a spreadsheet. And what you can do here is effectively capture all your input criteria that form your plan so that you know exactly what you need to invest and what you need to look for when investing for dividends. So as an example, I'm assuming an average yield on cost upon investment of 3.25% and an annual dividend withholding tax rate of 20% and an average annual dividend increase of 5%. Now, these numbers are fictional. These are not my numbers. I'm always a little bit concerned about my privacy, hence why I'm using fake data here. But in general, what it will show you is like how much time it will take you to reach financial independence and how much money you would need for it at a certain yield. And this will tell you your monthly income as an example. So this is really important. So when you think about it, then the real thing I need to track is my income, right? And that's what I've been doing in my dividend portfolio template. By the way, I will put a link to this template in the description below. But hey, having said that, let's look at some other metrics currently when we look at my portfolio. So currently my portfolio yield is 3.65%. Last quarter, so by the end of March, it was 3.18%. Two reasons why it went up. One, I invested in higher yielding stocks due to stocks coming down over the last quarter, the, stock, uh, the share price crash that we have seen. Secondly, my portfolio generally uh, went down in, in, in some areas. Hence, also the yield went up. And if we look at that from a portfolio point of view, if we would only look at the share prices uh, improvement, I can also tell you this is why I love dividend investing again. Because look, my total portfolio value, yeah, if you really look, if you really want to look at that, still went up. But what you could also say is like over the last quarter, I actually didn't make money because all the money I invested over the last three months are effectively gone. It allowed me to see an increasing yield. And at the same time, it kept my overall performance uh, value at a similar level. Not that it's that much important. I actually would have loved to see it go down like we saw at the start of the pandemic because that even gives better buying opportunities for me. But you know, this is a high level view. Let's also look at the more detailed view of my portfolio. So my largest position by far is still Royal Dutch Shell, followed by Microsoft, AppVi, ExxonMobil and Unilever. Honestly, I didn't invest in any of these stocks over the last quarter. What we can see here, though, is that, for instance, from a dividend income allocation point of view, is that Shell is by, by far the largest dividend payer for me. What we can see also is that Afi, ExxonMobil also do really well here. 
uh, from a portfolio allocation point of view, Shell is 8% of my portfolio. This is way too high. I wouldn't like it to be more than 3 or 4%. The thing is, I'm not investing in Shell anymore. It's a large position for me. It's a full position for me. So the rest of the portfolio will need to pull up now. And by that, it will reduce automatically the portfolio allocation in Shell. But you know, what I also would like to share with you is that investing is not easy and I'm not perfect. I'm not good at timing the market, okay? But that's why I always look at valuations. Because as an example, what you can see here is I bought Microsoft really cheap, between 40 and 60 or $80 or something like that. It went almost up fivefold since then. Same with Upfi, I bought at $65. But look at Danone, yeah? I, I've been two years ago, I was really bullish on Danone. Yeah, I really love their products. I really think they have a good play, but the stock went nowhere over the last two years. They even did a small 4% dividend cut. In the end, I stuck with them because I still feel it gives good value and I believe in their long-term prospects, but it has been dead money over the last two years. Similar from Bus F, you know, really cyclical. So no wonder it's down. I think this company is really a great opportunity here. Of course, you need to really account for the risk of Russian gas prices. So if you don't feel comfortable with that, stay away. If you believe that this will fade out over the next four or five years, maybe you want to consider it. Other stocks that I did poorly on, 3M, Bayer, but also here Castellum. And I liked Castellum at 200 Swedish crowns. It went all the way down to 135 crowns. And I believe that it was even trading at around 250 last year. That's almost a 40, 50% stock crash just in Castellum. So it makes you wonder, is something going on here with the stock? I did my homework. I believe that the fair value is around 200. That's why I decided also to buy some more in the last quarter. Around, I believe, 137 was my last purchase. At the moment, by the way, it's still just 2.2% of my portfolio. So if this company would go bankrupt, just a dividend hikes from all the other companies, let's say 5%, would still allow me to not even notice Castellum as such overall in the big numbers. Now, of course, I don't think Castellum will go down at all. I think their dividend is pretty safe. So I'm a happy buyer at this one because you will get it now at a current yield of 5.6%. And what you can also see is that I have an average yield on cost of 4.2%. I'm happy with this. Honestly, I'm really happy with this. I will not buy something now again because I've been buying quite a lot over the last three, four months. I have to wait a little bit not to catch a falling knife. But if this is still trading, let's say in September like this, well, consider me to add some Castellum again. And you know, this is the same with Intel, right? I'm bullish on Intel long term, not short term. I think the stock can still fall, fall further. But at a 4% yield, it's really interesting for me. It's still a relatively small position for me. So again here, I might consider to add more uh, at the prices of 36 or even in the low 30s. For me, it's just too cheap to ignore. So, hey, this is a bit of how I'm looking at my portfolio. So you see, I definitely have some losers here, but most of these positions are short term investments. I just bought them over the last half year, like Intel and uh, Castellum as an example. So for me, this shows also the power of dividend investing and long term investing because all the other stocks are all long term holdings of mine. No way that I will lose money in the next year on Microsoft. Yeah, if it really would drop to six dollars, I will be loading up the truck. But of course, maybe there will be something else wrong at that moment, but I just can't imagine. Yeah. Having said that, I hope I showed you here that I'm also human, that I make a lot of mistakes. Actually, if you would judge it from a price point of view, but honestly, this is the only chart that matters here. The only chart that I track really on the long term, and that's my annual dividend income. And the, what I can tell you, the only way is up. So now that we got here, you know, the stock market is providing us so many great opportunities. Hence, let's also have a really quick look at how I screen for stocks and what I currently consider to be on my watch list. So first of all, I will put a link also to this in the description of this video. So if you go to my blog, europeandgi.com, and you tap the link dividend investing here in the menu, you will be able to go to my dividend stock screener. Don't be mistaken, this is not a calculator or something like that or a search engine. It shows you and it tells you how I screen for, st uh, for stocks and why I screen like that for stocks. So first of all, this is all part of the search phase, right? 
I look for dividends that at least have a dividend yield of 2.75%. This has to do with my 3.25% criteria if I look at my long-term plan. So why I would really go for a dividend stock with 1% yield, it really doesn't serve me well. Second one, dividend payout ratio is less than 70%. I want to have safe dividends. And one of those early, let's say, litmus test is checking the payout ratio, both from an EPS, earnings per share, or free cash flow point of view. And then the third one that I really want to look at is like, has it been actually increasing the dividends for at least five years? And what was the average increase as well? So this is really important for me when screening for stocks. And it really washes out also, for instance, the fear of missing out when you see other people talking about really high growth stocks and you think like, oh, they actually also pay a growing dividend. Their dividend has been growing 10%, but if it still gives you 1% yield, it still takes me decades to get to, for instance, a 10% yield on cost. So, you know, why wait? And we can see actually now after one year of stock crashes that many of those stocks start nearing the 2.75% entry criteria. And for me, that means entering potentially value zone. And until then, I actually generally don't really bother looking into those. Maybe one or two exceptions like ASML. So, you know, this is how I screen. These are my three criteria, but at the same time, I've done my homework already. So I don't need to always run everything through a screener because look, if you go to another page on my uh, blog, which you can find under the My Portfolio menu and then the Allocation Strategy, scroll down and you will effectively see a whole list of stocks that I consider the, to be part of my allocation future portfolio. It tells you in which tier it is and you can see an allocation of 4%. And I'm talking here rather around dividend income probably than, than stock value. Um, so I've got all the tickers already. I've done my homework, so I know which stocks I want. And I can also show that there are still some stocks or some positions left for some stocks I, I don't own yet, right? But generally speaking, I've got everything already prepared. So if I go back to my dividend portfolio, I create it manually. You won't find it in template, but you can easily do this yourself. I created the same overview here. The only thing I did then is here, put my fair value estimate in there. I already put the dividend position size in there. So when it's more than 50%, it's giving me a warning, like, do you really want to add more at this moment in time? When it's in red, it means full position. Don't bother. Yeah. So if I then look at also the current yield, let's say it should be 2.75% at a minimum. Based on that, I give myself an advice. And when it's on consideration, it means it's either undervalued or the yield is good. You know, this also gives me a nice list of what to buy. So as an example, 3, 3M pops up here yeah, as a, as a buy. Siemens pops up as a buy because they are both giving attractive yield and are in my consideration undervalued. Yeah. So this is one way of really screening for stocks and preparing yourself for buying high quality stocks and under these market conditions. And as an example, for me, Siemens, and 3M are high quality stocks, tier two stocks. I know that 3M is having some issues. I know that Siemens is cyclical. So maybe Siemens under 100 is just a really, really good time to start considering it, right? So I would recommend everyone to do this for the dividend portfolio because it's so much easier to buy stocks right now. This is really what makes me sleep well at night. I've done my homework in the past. I don't doubt my homework. I've done it. I am conservative by nature. So I feel really comfortable with that. But you can take it even to the next stage because together with Engineer My Freedom, we've been building our own dashboard, right? And this is sometimes what I show in the other videos. You see me going through a page where you see all the criteria. I will show that later again. But also, you know, this is now a collection of, let's say, 60, 70 stocks that we have analyzed together. Yeah. So what I can do now already, I can use it as a screener. So because I use Google Data Studio here, it's on top of a G sheet. The G sheet contains all the data. And then in Google Data Studio, I make it interactive for me and present it in a way that I can easily understand it. So let's screen for it, right? If I would have it on zero, you would see that there are lots of stocks here. But let's go to a minimum yield of 2.7%. Let's take also that I want a dividend growth of, let's say, at least 5%. And the EPS payout ratio, not more than, than 100. I know I put it on 70%. I want to exclude one-offs and because sometimes the free cash flow payout ratio is really good. So if we look at that, I'm now getting 17 stocks here, right? 17 stocks 
that currently today match my screening criteria. So based on this, it makes my homework so much easier. You might ask, why am I not going to a normal screener online or something like that? Well, simply said, most of the European stocks are not reliable in the screeners because they present incorrect data. It has a lot to do with annual dividends versus quarterly, the timing, calendar, fiscal, all these kinds of stuff. So having my own dashboards and stocks that I'm interested in, dividend stocks, makes it much more easier for me. So what I can do now here based on this, okay, let's, let's think about it. I'm interested in the ones with the highest dividend growth and also thinking, could they continue doing this forward? The first stock that really pops up on my radar is Snap-on. Yeah, Snap-on Incorporated, I didn't know it until two, three weeks ago. I only learned it by questions from you, the community. So if we look at it here, 2.87% yield, check. 17.4% dividend growth over the last five years. Check, EPS payout ratio, I mean really low with 36% and a forward PE of 12. It sounds too good to be true, right? Okay, so let's start looking into this. Let's go to the uh, analysis on a page. Let's go to snap on and let's check what it, has to what it has to give us and to tell us. So if I look now at snap on, right? And this is really what I love about this company here. Everything is in green, all the key statistics and on top of that, it shows really good dividend growth. It was giving $1.4 in 2012, 5.3 right now. This is a really, really large growth and it's truly amazing. So if you don't know Snap-on, Snap-on is actually, if you go to their shop, it's already really easily, it tells you everything. It's like the Black & Decker of this world. It sells all these uh, equipment that men just love, right? So this is a company um, that has been probably doing really well also because of, let's say, the housing boom, the industrial boom, uh, global population growth, uh, middle class rising. It has really had some tailwinds over the last decade. So if we then look at it currently, the fair value calculation is $230. How is this being done? So the free cash flow of 770 million is being used. And we can see that it is kind of higher than what it was pre-pandemic. We need to take the pre-pandemic boom into consideration. But it sounds like uh, quite fair, I would say, to, to, to work with the 770. If you then also look at the free cash flow growth assumptions going forward over the first five years is 5% thereafter 3% and at a discount rate of 10% because this is the return that I require and then a terminal multiple of 16 would give it $230, right? It's currently trading at 198, so we could say that it's like 16% undervalued. So for me, this is a company, this is currently on my watch list and that I will do a deeper dive on, yeah? So I still need to do my analysis at a glance, this looks really, really good. What I will really need to do now is read the 10K, read the last thank you to understand really like what is it really that this company is doing and can I reasonably make some assumptions for their growth going forward. So the next company that came on my list, uh, on my watch list is Texas Instruments. I think you have seen this already if you follow me also on social media several times. I just love this company. In the analog uh, chip industry, I think it's the leading one. I got a question the other day on the podcast versus NXP. I think NXP is also a really nice company to look into, but I also already own Intel, so I don't need further chip stocks in my portfolio. The dividend growth speaks for itself. Um, the EPS payout of 55% and free cash flow payout of 68%. If you would go to the website of um, Texas Instruments, I mean, it's really a conservative investor's wet dream. It also shows you straight away that it has a free cash flow growth of, I think, 11 or 14 percent over over time. So for me, this company is now also definitely undervalued. It's trading at $148. My fair value is $166. I think the, the free cash flow assumption is OK here. I took a little bit more at the time. Uh, when I analyzed this company back in February, um, 21 February this year, because, you know, I believe the company is still growing. I have also high growth assumptions. So it is important that you take this into consideration. If you are bearish on the current market conditions and on the, on the I would say, chip industry, then really look at my bearish scenario because then it's $116 and definitely it will be uh, overvalued. Uh, at this moment in time. So please take this into consideration. I'm bullish on this stock. That's why the fair value is higher than what you saw just on Snap-on because with Snap-on I have too many unknowns. 
So this was about Texas. Let's also go now to the next one and that is Target. And what I love about Target actually and why I like it is I was watching one time at a video of Ian Lopuk, you know, PPC Ian. He has a great YouTube channel and I will put the link to the video in the description of this video. What I loved was that his wife was speaking about Target and how the loyalty program works, how the ordering works, how the shipping works, why women love Target. I mean, for me, this, these are kind of the, the content that we are missing in the financial YouTube community because that is one of the best videos ever that I've seen about know what you own. And this is also why I really understand Target much better because I'm in Europe, not in America. It's always really difficult for me to have local American companies to invest in when I've never touched or seen their products. The good thing is at Target, when I was in the States, I took the opportunity to go there two years ago. And I must say, I really enjoyed the, uh, the customer experience there. So in this case, I think the company is still overvalued, right? The company is currently trading at a price to free cash flow of 32, but look at that, the, the free cash flow went really down over the last quarter. It has to do with inflation cost, cap working capital, think about inventory and such. But generally speaking, the EPS payout is still at 36%, but just the free cash flow is really high at the moment. So I'm taking here a free cash flow baseline of 4.2 billion, which is approximately what it did in 2017 and 2019. I think this is fair. 5%, uh, 3% growth rate uh, assumptions and the terminal multiple of 14 gives me a fair value of 130. So it still would need to get 10% down. But around that price, I might start nibbling in a little bit into target. You also need to know is that around that time, it will be yielding 3.25 or 3.30%. And you know, 50 years of dividend growth, it's a dividend king. I mean, hard to ignore, right? So the fourth company that I have on my watch list for July that I might buy more of is, in this case, 3M. 3M has been really, really beaten down, I would say. It was trading around almost $200. I did a video earlier this year, I believe in January, where I was saying like fair value around $170. I bought something then also around that time. I've reassessed it. I think there's some more risk involved right now. I've become more conservative on this company. My fair value today stands at $149. And I believe it's currently 16% undervalued. It takes the litigation into the consideration. I think a baseline uh, free cash flow to extrapolate from a 5.5 billion is relatively fair at a 5% and 3% growth rate thereafter again and a multiple of 14. I believe that this company is definitely fairly valued. And I put in already a board, uh, buy order at $119.10. Why that? it will give me exactly a 5% dividend yield on cost on that investment. Uh, I own already some 3M, but I could own some more. Hence, I can be a bit more greedy in my opinion. Last but not least is a company that EMF and I have spoken several times already a little bit about also on the podcast because it was our big discovery and this is DCC. If you're not familiar with DCC, it's a company that is really in the international sales and marketing uh, and mainly in the energy, healthcare and technology uh, industry. They also do a lot of consult consultancy here. So you need to know they work a lot with those big players like Royal Dutch Shell and such to really offer their services. What I love here is that you can also see the profit uh, by division here and it tells you that energy is by far the biggest. But what I also like is that they are relatively diversified across Europe, right? But you know what is of course really interesting about the company of DCC? It's an Irish company trading on the uh, London Stock Exchange. How often do we see these kind of companies popping up in our, on our radar? So if you look at DCC, right, it currently has 30 years of dividend growth, which is quite unique. Uh, in my opinion, it's one of the best dividend growth stocks currently trading in the FTSE 100. Their dividend went up from 60 in 2011 to 175 right now. That's three times more. So, you know, it's no surprise that their dividend has been growing with more than 12%. We also know that the oil industry and the oil and gas industry is booming at the moment right now. Cash flows are coming in at the big oil majors. So I expect DCC to do well as well during the current fiscal year. So if we look at it, almost everything on green here. Revenue growth has been a little bit timid. I think they could, could do better here. But generally, we could say they have strong cost control. They really understand how to do it. 
They're also continuously strong in value creation because their return on invested capital is far beyond the cost of their capital of 10%. And I really love such a spread. I'm looking at typically more than 2%. So 10%, I mean, super. If we then look at it, you know, free cash flow 450, it was 565 in 2021. We do need to know that in 2019 was 278. So I could see this company one time come back to 300 again if there would be a really hard oil crisis. But even during the depth of the oil crisis in 2016, it still made 150. So let's work for now with 450 because I think the oil industry is really booming and I don't expect it to go anytime soon down. So growth rate 7% and then uh, thereafter five years 4%. You need to know that they have been growing 12% their dividends so far and their EPS growth was 8.5%. So I'm below this. I find this more conservative in my opinion. If I then take a, a terminal multiple of 15 should give us 7,391 pence as a fair value and it's currently trading at 5,000 pence. So 50, uh, 50 pounds, I believe. Having said that the dividend yield with that is 3.45% at a payout ratio of let's say around 50%. This makes for me DCC PLC currently another company on my watch list, which I find actually quite attractive right now. So guys, this is it. These are the five stocks that I currently have on my watch list. I still need to do some homework specifically on Snap-on, but please let me know what you think about it. Do you own any of these five stocks? Do you agree that these are watch list potential candidates? Or maybe I'm missing an awesome stock uh, to consider in July. If so, please drop those tickers in the comment section below this video. If time permits this week, I might actually look into some of those. Having said that, guys, have a great weekend. Let me know if you like these kinds of videos of portfolio reviews and watch list. I really appreciate it. Have a great weekend, everybody.